Good evening. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Kahilu Theatre Foundation, I welcome you to the Kahilu Theatre's 31st season, and in particular to our Makana series. The Makana series is 24 events from lectures, sli uh, slideshows, films, live performances that are open free to the public and anyone who happens to be visiting the island. Tonight we have a wonderful lecture provided by uh, Keck Observatories. But before we start, I want to thank the Lee family and Lakeside Industries for making it possible for the Kahilu Theatre to host the Makana series during its 31st season. In addition, while I'm up here, it's a wonderful time to pull out your cell phone, take a look at your watch alarms, and make sure they are in the off or vibrate mode so they don't disturb you, your neighbor, or the lecturer this evening. Before we get to the lecturer, I would like to bring to the stage George Blumenthal. He is the chairman of the Keck Observatory's board of director. He is also the chancellor of the University of California at Santa Cruz and an astrophysicist. Please welcome to the stage, George Blumenthal. Thank you. thank you very much and thank you all for coming. This, this, this will be a really interesting evening tonight. But before we begin, I'd like to thank Rob and Terry Ryan and the Friends of Keck Observatory, who have sponsored these events through the Rising Star Fund, which funds these public presentations. They're important. It's clear that there's an audience, and they have done so much to make this possible. So thank you. Tonight, is, it is my pleasure to introduce my old friend, Tom Seufer. I've known Tom for many years, and Tom is a man who wears many hats. He is simultaneously a professor of physics at Caltech, the dean of the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy at Caltech as well. He is a long-standing member, along with me, of the Keck Observatory Board that runs the Keck Observatory. Formerly, he was the head of the Science Steering Committee, which made all of the technical recommendations with regard to running the observatory. And in addition, in his spare time, he is the director of the Spitzer Science Center, which runs NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, which was launched in 2003, and which you'll hear a lot more about this evening. Tom got his bachelor's degree at Caltech, and then moved on to Cornell, where he, re where he received his PhD degree. I met Tom when he was a postdoc at UC San Diego, and he left UC San Diego in 1978 to go to Caltech as a faculty member, where he's remained ever since. Tom has done throughout his career a tremendous amount of important work. He was involved in the first infrared, infrared satellite ever launched, called IRAS. Uh, he's been involved in the conception of, of important instruments at the Keck Observatory, including the NERC and the NERC-2. And in 19, 30, 1993, he had the first run on the observatory's workhorse spectrographs, Deimos and Elrez. So he has done a lot. His research has been extremely broad. You'll hear a lot about that today. But he's particularly specialized in adolescent galaxies. And I have to tell you, Understanding adolescent galaxies is a lot more difficult than even understanding adolescent humans. <laughs> so Tom has been very, very heavily involved in our field of astronomy. Tonight, Tom is going to talk ab uh, about the infrared universe. He's called this talk, Seeing the Invisible Universe. And in hearing that title, it brought up an image in my mind. Many of you have read H.G. Wells' book, The Invisible Man, or, or saw the movie made in the 1930s, The Invisible Man. And it makes me scratch my head and just wonder, gee, what would The Invisible Man be like if they actually used infrared detectors? <laughs> anyway, here he is. It is my pleasure to welcome Tom Seufer.
Well, thanks, George, for the very kind introduction. Um, I want to say, to begin with, that uh, I've been on that side of the stage many times, mostly to, to see the brothers Kaz when they come in June, but uh, uh, so I've, I never thought that I'd be on this side. Uh, so I guess it's a great fun to, uh, to see that the, the lectures have moved from, uh, from across the street to over to here, so I can be on this side for once. So um, what I want to tell you about mostly is the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is, if I can make my, there we go. Uh, this is a, uh, an artist's conception of the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, it's uh, currently operating uh, in solar orbit, and uh, uh, I hope to tell you both about what it is and uh, uh, some of the science. It's done a lot of science, and I certainly uh, don't plan to uh, cover it all, but I hope to tell you some of the, the science that I find most exciting. Um, I, it's been my great pleasure and honor to be associated with what I modestly refer to as the two best observatories uh, from Earth. The best observatory in space is the Spitzer Space Telescope, of course, and the best observatory on Earth is the Keck Observatory, which, uh, and I will try and tell you how, uh, partly how the two complement each other to really uh, produce a much, much broader and better understanding of the universe. So the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, is actually a very modest size telescope. It's, it's uh, the, the, the classical telescope, but diameter is 33 inches, which not about this big. Now, those of us who are used to these big telescopes on the ground, you know, Keck telescopes are 10 meters in diameter, so that's about 30, 36 uh, 36 feet across, um, and, uh, we're, and we're, of course, interested in building even bigger telescopes, but because Spitzer is cold and it's in space, it has the power of a, of a telescope, if it were on the ground, that would be a 30 meter diameter telescope. So I'll tell you about why that is. Um, let me tell you a little bit of the history of Spitzer. Uh, the first studies for Spitzer, it was actually at the time called the uh, Shuttle Infrared Telescope Facility, CERTIF. The first studies were, were done in about 1972. That's a while ago. In 1984, the teams were formed to, to build the instruments and really define the facility. And then in 1990, there, were, there was the great high and the great low for the facility, uh, for, for CERT, what was called CERTIF at that time. The high was that's, that CERTIF was, was defined by the 1990 Decadal Review of Astronomy and Astrophysics. This is where all the astronomers in the country come together and sort of say, tell, tell the federal agencies what the important projects should be for the next decade. Uh, so Spitzer was, was, said, was, was agreed to be the, the highest priority project in space at that time. And so that was the high. The low, which followed on very quickly, was that when, if you recall, that when the Hubble telescope was launched, they discovered that the mirror suffered from spherical aberration. And so there's a tremendous... Um, uh, re-examination of very large projects. At the time that we, in 1990, the, pro, Spitz, the CERTIF project was uh, estimated to cost about two and a half billion dollars. That was a lot of money, even then. Um, and so, uh, it caused us a tremendous uh, re-examination, and I like to, uh, to draw the analogy, sort of, we turn from what I would describe a dinosaur into a mammal. We turn the project from a two and a half billion dollar project into a half billion dollar project. And in 1995, we got the go ahead from NASA to proceed with the project. And, and the project that I'm going to describe is, is the project that, became a, that, that came out of that, uh, you know, having a, a near-death experience in a science project certainly uh, sharpens one's thinking very clearly. 
And so uh, we were able to really focus on what was important, what was the important science, and that defined the, the project and, and, uh, and guided us. And ultimately the project, as, I, as George said, was launched in 2003. We're still operating. And we could actually operate for another several years if NASA and uh, its funding decisions cooperate. So uh, let me start by reminding you about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. This is sort of a, a plot that goes all the way from gamma rays on the sh high energy short wavelength end to radio wavelengths on the, the low energy long wavelength end. And uh, in order to observe the universe, you really need to study all of the spectrum. And we have platforms over all of this range of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that, that we, we use to study the universe. There's a, temperature, a thermometer down here which characterizes the, what you, we might call the temperature of the objects that emit most uh, heavily at a particular wavelength. For example, very hot, billions of degrees are required to, for a body to emit in gamma rays. The, the bodies that emit where your eyes are most sensitive are, are, are objects very much like, like the sun, which is about 5,000 degrees. I should say, in, te in temperature scale, I'm going to be using the Kelvin scale, which is basically the centigrade scale, but uh, on an absolute scale, so that zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Uh, whereas, remember, zero centigrade is 273 degrees Kelvin. So, so the things that you're sensitive to, your eye is sensitive to, uh, emit most strongly at about 5,000 degrees. And that's where uh, the Keck Observatory, the, the instruments that work on the Keck Observatory, uh, are most sensitive in the optical and in the near-infrared. The wavelengths that, that Keck works at uh, uh, correspond to temperatures in the, from 1,000 degrees up to, uh, say, 10,000 or a bit more. Well, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which operates at longer wavelengths, therefore operates, uh, observes objects that are at, uh, typically at, at lower temperatures. And the, this is the, the, the temperature range associated with Spitzer. It sort of picks up just about where, where Keck stops. It starts at about three microns, uh, which is about six times the wavelength that your eye is most sensitive to. And it goes to 160 microns, which is uh, about uh, uh, 300 times the wavelength that your eye is most sensitive to. So that corresponds in these temperature units to objects that are between about 1,000 degrees and 20 to 30 degrees above, ab above absolute zero. So we're looking at very different environments than the, uh, the uh, objects that, that we observe uh, best with the Keck telescope. So the next thing I need to explain to you is why, it's, uh, why the, we should spend a billion dollars, actually a half a billion dollars, to, to launch a telescope into space. And the reason for that is, is portrayed in this slide, and there are two parts to it, two parts to the story. The first part, which is the transmission of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is either transparent or opaque, depending on the wavelength, and from two microns here to uh, a thousand microns, it's, most, it's mostly opaque. So the radiation from the universe does not penetrate to even a high altitude observing site such as Mauna Kea. We see some atmospheric windows over here, but mostly it's, uh, it's, it's uh, opaque. So you have to get above the atmosphere to see the radiation. But even more, more significantly, if you get above the atmosphere and you cool the telescope, you gain an enormous amount in sensitivity. Just as, if you think about it, the comparison between the brightness of the sky in the middle of the day to the middle of the night when the moon is not out, you can see, you can see a lot more in the sky. In the, in the day, you see, you see the sun if it's not cloudy. 
It's never cloudy in Hawaii. Um, at night, you see thousands of stars. The reason for that is you've lowered, you've reduced the brightness of the sky by about a factor of a million. Okay? If you do exact, virtually the same thing by taking a telescope and launching it above the atmosphere and reducing its uh, temperature so it's not emitting. If you put a telescope, even the Keck telescope, on, on the ground, it emits at infrared wavelengths uh, corresponding to its temperature, which is in the middle of the infrared, plus you have the atmospheric emission. And so the combination of that corresponds to this brightness level. Taking that say, a telescope and putting it in the above the atmosphere, cooling it to, in fact, in the case of, of uh, Sertif, uh, Spitzer, uh, about five degrees above absolute zero, you reduce entirely that self-emission at the wavelengths that you care about, and so you reduce the brightness of the sky by a factor of a million. You gain from that a factor of a thousand in sensitivity, and so you turn a uh, one-meter class telescope, which is uh, Spitzer, into the same sensitivity of uh, a telescope that was sitting on the ground that would have a thousand times the collecting area something like the 30-meter telescope, which we hope to build, to put on Mauna Kea in the uh, not-too-distant future. So that's why, you, why it's worth putting this telescope in space. The, another feature which, I re which we really had not appreciated in, uh, until, until uh, we started flying Spitzer, and which, which has become very important in the study of exoplanets, is the stability of the environment. Putting a telescope in space necessarily makes it a more stable environment. You can make more precise measurements. And when we're trying to study exoplanets, we're taking, we're making the measurement, the difference between two very large numbers. And the fact that we can make those measurements with tremendous precision allows us to, to really open a whole new world in science, in, in studying um, the, uh, uh, in studying and characterizing uh, planets orbiting other stars. So that's another feature of putting a telescope in space that we don't have on the ground. So let me just tell you about some of the most important features. This is a cutaway drawing of the observatory. The solar panels which collect the power uh, are sitting over here, the sun would be over there. The solar panel does another very important thing. It blocks the sunlight from hitting this uh, shroud which, which color, covers and protects the telescope. The telescope is sitting here. It's a, it's a, t it's a classical uh, a one meter uh, uh, collecting area uh, telescope which then feeds the light into the instrument bay which is sitting here. All of this uh, at least the instruments, and, and were cooled by, by superfluid helium. And um, the important uh, innovation of Spitzer, which really made it tremendously uh, capable in, in terms of extending its lifetime, we did a very clever thing. We painted the back shell of the, of the, the, the shroud here black. What that does is it lets the, the uh, it, it causes the, this, this, the uh, shell to radiate, to radiate into, into dark space. And space has a, a temperature of three degrees, so this radiation is a very strong coolant. And because of that, we're able to, to bring the temperature of this whole structure to about 30 degrees Kelvin, 30 degrees above absolute zero, which meant that the 300 liters of superfluid helium that we started with in here was able to last for five years and eight months. Um, by comparison, to just show you what, what an advancement this was over previous concepts for, for infrared observatories, uh, George mentioned that I worked on the, the IRAS satellite, the first uh, infrared sky survey. There we had a telescope that was not too much different in size from this. We launched it and uh, we cooled the telescope and the instruments uh, with, with superfluid helium again. And 
we had a, a cryostat that, that, that carried 700 liters of helium. Remember, this is 300 liters. It lasted for five years, eight months. In IRAS, we, we had a, cry, a 700 liter uh, cryostat and it lasted for 10 months. So this, this uh, using ra the, the laws of physics, uh, radiation to cool the, the whole system is a tremendous gain and really has set the, the uh, path for the future. Of, of infrared space missions. So those are the sort of the innovative things about, about the satellite. This is a, a picture of the, the instruments. There are three instruments here. Uh, there are two cameras, a short wavelength camera called IRAC, which imaged at wavelengths 3.6, 4.5, 5.8, and 8 microns. Uh, remember, visible light is about one half micron, the light that your eye is sensitive to. So this is starting at about uh, seven times the wavelength of visible light and goes to about 16 times. The field of view of this imager is uh, five arc minutes, so it's about one-sixth of the size of the full moon. The long wavelength imager was, uh, again, the same field of view, the one-sixth of the, of the size of the full moon, at much longer wavelengths, 24, 70, and 160 microns. So that's about uh, uh, 50 to 300 times the wavelength of light that you can see. In addition to two sets of imagers, we had four separate spectrographs uh, that spanned the range from 5 to 40 microns with two separate spectral resolutions. Uh, one of the things that you learn when you deal with, um, with space projects is once it's launched, you can't go fix it. So you don't want anything to go wrong, which means you don't want, you want to minimize the moving parts. So in these three instruments, we have one moving part, and that moving part was necessary for some of the detectors to be able to operate. So these, these instruments, while we are helium-cooled, operated at 1.2 degrees above absolute zero. So after the, uh, the helium ran out, uh, which was in May of 2009, the, 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 the telescope warmed up to about 25 degrees above absolute zero. The, the instruments warmed up to 27 degrees above absolute zero. Still pretty cold, but it's pretty warm compared to what they were operating at. Now, all of the channels in gray stopped operating. Uh, the two channels that, re that continue to operate are the detectors at 3.6 and 4.5 microns. And they, because of uh, judicious selection of the uh, uh, of the devices, uh, 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 a lot of forethought um, from the instrument team that built it, uh, continued to operate at the same performance level, the same sensitivity as they had been operating during the cooled mission. So that's why we have what we're, where, where we are now is what we call the, the warm Spitzer mission. So we continue to operate uh, using only the radiation cooling of that shell to, to keep the, the, the observatory cold, but we're, we have the same performance uh, uh, equivalent, remind you, of a, the equivalent of a 30-meter telescope on the ground uh, from this little one-meter telescope. Okay. So the other innovative thing, I'm not sure that you can really see, is the orbit of Spitzer. Uh, a, crucial, a crucial part of building uh, 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 an observatory is uh, maximizing the mass that you put into orbit. And the way that we could maximize the mass was by basically putting all of the, the rocket into, into carrying payload and not having to carry anything to, to, to control the, where the satellite was in its orbit. So, so we, instead of being in a, an Earth orbit, we're in a solar orbit. So in this case, the Sun is here, the Earth is here, and Spitzer is over here. Uh, actually, uh, this, I took this picture off of the Spitzer website about uh, uh, two weeks ago, 
And at that time, uh, the distance from Spitzer to the Earth was already greater than the distance from uh, the, the Sun to the Earth. So we're already, well, it's, Spitzer is, is sort of fading away from the Earth, uh, moving at a rate such that in about another 50 years, it will make a complete circle and come back to the Earth. But we don't, I don't need to worry about that one. <laughs> okay, so that's what Spitzer is about. Now I want to tell you <clears throat> about the science that we've been doing. And... Rather than, rather than just reading you the titles of this more than 3,000 papers that have been, been uh, written from Spitzer data, I wanna, I'm basically picking the, my favorite uh, science topics, which mostly do not have anything to do with science that I've been doing with Spitzer. So, so, but the first thing is I want to really show you what the galaxies and, and objects within our own galaxy look like in the infrared as compared to visible light, the, the, the images that you've probably seen for many years. So the first one is, is a, a picture, of, this is an image of the Great Nebula in Andromeda M31, for those of you who are amateur astronomers. Uh, and here's a visible image of of this galaxy. You can see there's the nucleus of the galaxy. Mostly you see starlight and you see these dark bands. Those dark bands are interstellar dust which absorb the starlight. That dust actually, because it absorbs the light which is energy, it has to re-radiate that, that, that same amount of energy but it does so at a very much colder temperature than the starlight. And what we see in the infrared image from Spitzer is the, rather than seeing the starlight, mostly what we see is the glowing of the, of the dust that, is, uh, that makes up these bands. This is the interstellar material in this galaxy. That's, that's, tip, that's what a, a galaxy, very much like our own uh, Milky Way, would look like. Um, uh, let me go back. Okay, so here's, here, try it again, there we go. Another galaxy that's very nearby, uh, M82, which is a, a nearby starburst galaxy, which I'll, I'll come back to a little later. It, here's a visible image. It sees, you see a lot of stars. You see some dust lanes in here. This is in the visible, which are blocking the light. Uh, it's been known for a long time. This, this was characterized as an, quote, exploding galaxy. Images in the infrared show that not only do you see the starlight in here, and you can actually peer into the very center of the galaxy, and so you can, you can study what's, what's, what's uh, powering the system, but you see that this, this material that's been ejected from the galaxy is very much more extensive. It, you can see it's being illuminated and glowing very f much farther away uh, than you could, you could possibly see in the visible light. So you, you're able to trace this, uh, the interstellar dust much farther out and, and see the effects of, uh, of uh, um, the, uh, the explosions within the galaxy that have ejected a lot of material. Closer to, to home, um, in, in our own galaxy, Perhaps many of you are familiar with this uh, image from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is referred to as the Pillars of Creation. This is an environment where, where, where stars are being formed inside these, uh, these, these uh, structures that look like, look like pillars. Uh, and the pillars are, 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 are made of dust, and the dust is absorbing the starlight, that's why you're seeing these in, in what looks like silhouette. And, and the action that's going on inside of here is, in, is not visible to us. We can't penetrate that with this, this uh, uh, starlight, uh, with, in the visible light. But if you move to the infrared and you look at the entire region, you see that the whole region is aglow in in, uh, in this interstellar dust, and the pillars of creation are this very modest uh, area here where you can see that these columns are actually glowing, and they're being powered by uh, the, the stars that are forming inside them. That's, that's the kind of uh, 
thing that you find in, in with, with when you study regions in, in infrared, that, that they're gl the, 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 the interstellar dust uh, is glowing and you can see that very clearly. One thing that I, one, m much of what we do with Spitzer is, is imaging. Um, it's very hard to show uh, nice pictures of spectra. Spectra are very difficult to explain, but uh, infrared spectra are very important for, for really understanding uh, and, and uh, diagnosing uh, the environments of, of regions. Um, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's what what's lets us uh, uh, really uh, understand what, what is the content of of, of, of an environment, and, and in particular, infrared spectra, uh, from infrared spectra, uh, we can really uh, identify molecules and dust grains, what the, what the material content of, of, of the uh, molecules and dust grains are in a particular region. And the one spectrum I'm going to show you tonight is, a, is probably, in, in my mind, it's, it's my favorite spectrum from Spitzer, which is uh, a spectrum. This is a planetary nebula. These, the white line is the data. The, the uh, red uh, ticks and the red spectrum are carbon-60 buckyballs. And the blue uh, spectrum and the blue ticks are the identification of C70, both uh, forms of fullerene, a very complex carbon molecule, the discovery of which in, in the laboratory in, on Earth about two decades ago uh, was deserving of, uh, of a Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, what one of the things that Spitzer has demonstrated is that these very complex molecules are present in these astrophysical environments. How these molecules are made in this environment is still uh, a mystery, but this is one of the kinds of things that infrared spectroscopy does. It lets us uh, effectively find, you know, the, the identify what those specific molecules are. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we do with Spitzer, and what I want to do for the rest of, of this talk is tell you about three, three different areas of science where Spitzer has, has made significant contributions. And I've chosen these both uh, because I think they're fun, but also because I think they also illustrate the importance of combining the data from Spitzer with ground-based observatories like Keck. And I'll try and explain to you how that works as well. So the first one of these is studying the universe uh, uh, roughly uh, three billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, and the, the galaxies that are producing uh, tremendous amounts of, of energy at that time. Remember, the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old, so we're talking about looking a look back time of about 10 billion years. I have to start by putting this in context and going back to this picture of M82, our nearby starburst galaxy. Most galaxies, like the Milky Way, produce a modest amount of their luminosity that emerges in the infrared. A starburst galaxy like M82 produces 90% of its energy in the infrared, and that's illustrated in this plot where we've plotted the amount of energy as a function of wavelength, where here's the starlight component, the visible light, uh, and then here's the, 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 the infrared component, and it goes from about 10 microns to 100 microns and beyond, and there's about an order of magnitude, more, a factor of 10 more energy emerging in, in, at, in, in, the far, in the far infrared than in the visible and near infrared. So we've, we've known about these kinds of systems for quite a while, and in fact, the first uh, satellite project that I work on, IRAS, discovered that, uh, that, these gal that there were a number of dusty, luminous galaxies in the, in the nearby universe. IRAS didn't have the, the sensitivity to, to look very far into the universe. But it found that these galaxies were common, but 
they, were, they produced a minor fraction of the luminosity in the local universe. And I would describe this, that they, were, uh, they found these kinds of galaxies were rare but interesting. And so people like me would spend a lot of time uh, after we found these things uh, going to, to telescopes like Keck, studying them in great detail. I think the important thing that we learn is that a lot of the interesting activity, the, the enormous generation of energy was hidden behind dust in these galaxies. And that, uh, um, uh, and so one used the infrared to find them, and then one used, needed to, to use uh, other tools of the trade, the, the instruments of the Keck Observatory, to really probe these systems in, in, in detail, to understand them. Um, after IRAS, there were a couple of other satellites, COBE and ISO in particular, uh, which, also, which showed that the dusty starburst galaxies were, were much more common when the universe was much younger. Remember I told you that these kinds of galaxies locally were rare but interesting. Uh, COBE in particular showed uh, that uh, half of the energy, the, the total energy output of galaxies integrated over the, the uh, history of the universe was emerging in the infrared. So what kind of galaxies were producing this energy? Where were they within, as you look back in the universe? Well, Spitzer, these are the kinds of questions we wanted to answer, and Spitzer was the first telescope that really had the sensitivity to be able to, to search for such these very dusty, very luminous galaxies to great cosmological distances. And so this is sort of one of the, the no-brainer projects that we, we designed the observatory around. So the kinds of questions that we, we wanted to address were, are there new populations of highly luminous objects that we hadn't known about before that were not uh, seen in the local universe? How important were these in the energy budget of the universe? How might they be related to the kinds of things we know about today? And how are these related? How can we put all of this together into a picture of how galaxies form, uh, grow, and evolve? Now, that's kind of the questions that we're, we're, we're trying to get to. And of course, so what we did with uh, Spitzer, uh, with taking deep images, at these long wavelengths that you certainly can't do from the ground, is we actually indeed found, but this is a plot of uh, just the number of galaxies versus the ratio of the amount of energy that's coming out in the infrared versus the visible. And what we found is there was a, a very large fraction of the galaxies uh, that we saw were uh, much more extreme in, the, in terms of the, 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 the amount of energy coming out in the infrared compared to the visible uh, than anything we knew about in the local universe. And in fact, uh, as I say here, something like 12% of the total galaxies were, were, uh, were these really extreme uh, infrared luminous galaxies. Uh, and so not only there not only are they interesting, but they're no longer rare. And of these galaxies, uh, something like 90, 98% of the luminosity uh, comes out in the, in the infrared. And so these, we, we describe these as, as dust-obscured galaxies. Galaxies, remember I told you, many galaxies, part of the region of a galaxy is hidden, hidden by dust where the, the energy comes out in the infrared. No, entire galaxies are being hidden by dust. And so you really only see the energy output in, in the infrared. Well, once you find this kind of a population, the first question you have to ask is, how far away is it? Because that tells you how luminous is it? How important is this in, in the whole energy budget of the universe? And with, uh, we needed, in order to, to answer this question, we needed not only the power of, of Spitzer, but we needed the power of, of Keck. For, for some of these systems, we actually found faint smudges of optical lights that we could get spectra with, uh, the, best, with the best spectrographs on the planet that were, were found at the Keck Observatory. Um, and, uh, 
the combination of that, we, we found that these very extreme systems typically uh, were at a distance of 10 billion light years. That's a long way away. And they were, have, they, as I mentioned, they most nearly all of their luminosity is emerging in, in the infrared. And the, the combination of the distance and the, and the brightness tells you what their luminosities are. And these are extremely luminous. They're, they're luminosities of 100 to 1,000 times the luminosity of uh, a galaxy like the Milky Way. So that's one of the things that we learned about these things by combining both the Spitzer data and, and Keck data from Keck. Another thing we did was uh, with, with Keck, we started taking pictures of these systems using the uh, adaptive optics uh, capability of the observatory. And, we, and these are pictures of some of these very distant systems. Uh, and I've compared these to these, some of the very nearby examples of similar kinds of things. Um, and the conclusion that we come to is that they, even though these are fainter and they're kind of harder to, to see, they, 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 kind of, they look kind of different. They don't seem to have this, the character of, of galaxies that are colliding and, and merging. Uh, probably there's a more these are in a more advanced stage of merger. Than, than the things that we're seeing in the nearby universe. The, the, the summary of, of this is that what we've concluded is that what we believe that we're seeing in these very luminous, very distant systems is uh, incredible star formation rates, a thousand uh, solar masses of stars being formed each year. The lifetimes are around uh, 100 million years, just take these two numbers and multiply them together and you find that over that kind of a span you're forming uh, 100 billion solar masses of stars, which is the most massive galaxies that we know about in, in the local universe. So what we think we're seeing is the most, uh, is, the, is the growth phase, if you will, the adolescent phase of the most massive galaxies in the nearby universe. So this is one of the, the, the areas w where Spitzer, I think, has made a significant contribution to, to our understanding of how, how the universe works. The, the next area that I want to tell you about is the universe uh, that's less than a billion years old. Um, this is certainly one of the major forefront areas of, of, of astronomical research, one where, where the Keck Observatory is, uh, is very heavily involved and invested. And to me, it's uh, astonishing that, this, uh, that my little 33-inch telescope can play a role in this, in this, in this uh, investigation. But remember, I told you that this has the same power of a 30-meter telescope on the ground. So it really is a powerful telescope. The way we find uh, galaxies that are very distant is you take a picture of the same patch of sky at a bunch of different wavelengths going from the vis visible light into the near infrared. And you say, aha, there's something I see here. It's, first of all, it's very faint. In, in the near infrared, and it's invisible at shorter wavelengths. And what we, we interpret this to be is that what you're seeing is the spectrum of a galaxy that has been attenuated by intervening uh, atomic hydrogen at some, at some redshift. And so, for, so it, uh, uh, all of the light at a shorter wavelength than, a, than the, the wavelength of the absorption of atomic hydrogen in the rest frame of, of the galaxy is completely blocked. The universe is opaque there. It becomes transparent at longer wavelengths. And you use this to get what's called a photometric uh, redshift for this galaxy. This is a particular example of finding a candidate galaxy at a redshift of seven. A redshift of seven corresponds to about 800 million years after the, after the Big Bang. So, so finding these things is not something that Spitzer can do. The wavelengths that Spitzer operates at are too long 
to be useful this, for this. This is, this is done by telescopes like the Keck Telescope, Subaru, or the Hubble Space Telescope. What Spitzer does, and I'm going to try and tell you why, how we do it, is to basically weigh these galaxies and determine their age. An important step in establishing that this technique really works is to, is to take a high-class spectrograph like we have at Keck and take a spectrum of some of these, of these systems and prove that this, this redshift that we've determined by this imaging technique, that's called the photometric technique, it corresponds to the redshift that you measure using a spectrograph a spectroscopic redshift. And these are two examples, redshift of about six and a half and a redshift of seven, where you've actually confirmed that the, the object is indeed at the redshift that you say it, it should be from this imaging technique. So, that's, so a very important step in, along the way here is the spectroscopic conver confirmation, which, which, which uh, uh, Keck is crucial for. Well, when we find these candidates, you have sort of, you stack up pictures. Here's, here's a nothing, nothing, maybe a little smudge. Uh, to the trained eye of an astronomer, maybe a smudge here. When you get to the Spitzer wavelengths, you don't even have to be a high-class astronomer, and you can see that there's something there. And so then you, you basically take the brightness as a function of wavelength, and you plot it along this, uh, this graph of brightness versus wavelength, and then you fit a, a calculation of what kind of galaxy that would be as, as a function uh, where of brightness versus wavelength and, and redshift. So you, you establish three things. You establish the, the redshift of the galaxy. You, you measure the, uh, the total mass by the total amount of light at the longer wavelengths, and then by the, basically, the difference in brightness at these shorter wavelengths to these longer wavelengths, you can, you can infer how old the galaxy is. It would be a, another, I guess, about 10 lectures to explain uh, how you do all of this, so I'll, I'll spare you that, but, but the key thing here is that uh, in this particular example for a galaxy which is seen about a billion years after the Big Bang, it's already a very massive galaxy. It's, it has a mass of about uh, 30 billion solar masses. That's probably about the same mass as our own Milky Way is now. So it's interesting that such a massive galaxy could have formed at that time. And most of the starlight is pretty old. It's, it has an age of about four, uh, 450 million years, which means that those stars have to have started forming only about a half a billion years after the Big Bang, which is starting to tell us when these very early galaxies formed in the universe. Here's another example pushing to a higher redshift, redshift uh, a seven, so we're now looking at a galaxy that's at about um, 800, formed about, or that we're, we're seeing it about 800 million years after the Big Bang. And this actually has a, a not as big a jump in flux between the Spitzer measurements and the uh, shorter wavelength measurements, so it's not, it's probably not as old as the one that I showed you before. And people are now the, the, the current frontier is, is pushing to yet higher redshift, redshift of eight, which corresponds to about 650 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, it's actually astonishing to me that my dippy little 33-inch telescope can find a galaxy at this uh, redshift, but uh, again, it's, it's the the enormous sensitivity gain that you get by putting this telescope into space. So you see here uh, the, these data, the, the flux versus, versus wavelength. We can infer a mass of about 2 billion solar masses that's seen uh, about 650 million years after the Big Bang, and its age is, is already about 300 million years. So we're able to push back even further 
the, 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 the epoch when galaxies really started to form significant numbers of stars. From all of this work, which has been done by a lot of people using lots of facilities with a lot of Keck telescope time, among others, and, and the, the work I'm showing you is a group that's at UC Santa Cruz, Garth Ellingworth and his collaborators. One, we're getting a picture now of being able to build up how, how the mass in galaxies grows as a function of time after the Big Bang. And you can see it grows quite rapidly in, in this epoch. This is, this is the kind of science that we really thought was we needed to have the James Webb Space Telescope to do. But we're finding the combination of ground-based facilities uh, the Hubble uh, Space Telescope and Spitzer are able to really start attacking this, this problem in a very uh, meaningful and significant way. The last topic I want to, to tell you about is a topic which is probably nearest and dearest to my heart because I've had absolutely nothing to do with it except being able to give out telescope time to, to, to to, for studies, and that is to uh, the study of, of planets orbiting other stars, exoplanets. <clears throat> uh, exoplanets weren't known when we were defining Spitzer. The first exoplanet was reported in 1996. As of, as of about a month ago, there were 725 planets known orbiting something over 600 stars. Uh, the vast majority of these were identified and discovered at, at the Keck Observatory based on studying the radial motion of the star, what, what, I, what is referred to as the reflex motion. If a star, if a planet is orbiting a star, it's going around and you can measure its velocity, but the, the star is also orbiting the planet with a much lower velocity and you measure the reflex uh, motion of the star to, to figure out that there's a planet. This is the this discovery plot of, of, that shows that the star uh, moved by about 100 meters per second in response to the planet that was orbiting it. So that's the way most planets orbiting other stars have been found. Uh, the more recent technique is the transit method where a planet moves across the, the line of sight to a star. It blocks a small fraction of the light of the star. You see the, the starlight here steady, then it drops for amount of time, and then it comes up again. This, and so this is, this is the transit method. Uh, this has been become the, uh, uh, probably right now, it's, it's the best way to discover new uh, planets orbiting other stars because of the, of the Kepler satellite, which is, was, was designed to actually do this job, but the Keck Observatory still plays a major role because in order to, you can measure the size of the planet by the depth of this drop, but in order to, uh, to determine uh, the mass of the planet, you still need this radial velocity. And it's and Keck remains the premier platform for determining radial velocities of, of, uh, of, for this exoplanet program. So, so that's, what, that's the, the general problem. What, is, what does Spitzer do here? Well, Spitzer doesn't measure radial velocities. Spitzer basically studies these transiting uh, planets. And I need to define some nomenclature. The transit is when the planet moves in front of the star. And this is an example of a Spitzer observation. This is actually about uh, 33 hours of continuous observation. When the, the planet moves in front of the star, it has this big drop where the planet has blocked some fraction of the light of the star. And then as the planet continues around in its orbit, it will then ultimately go behind the star, and that I refer to as the eclipse. And in that case, you can see in this particular case, the amount of total flux has dropped by a much smaller amount than in the transit, 
But what this is, is the, there's an, an amount of emission, of thermal emission from the planet, which is adding to the emission from the star. I forgot to say that all of this is all completely unresolvable uh, from ground-based telescopes. So you can only measure the difference in the light that's coming to you. So you have this very small dip in the amount of light that's coming to you. And so you know that from that, this is the star plus the planet. This is the star only. The difference between those two is the, the flux from the planet. You've measured, you can measure the size of the planet from the depth of this, of the transit. The flux measured here, the size of the planet, measured here, you can immediately determine the, the temperature of the planet at, that per, at the wavelength that you're making the measurement. And so that's one of the important things that Spitzer does. Another thing that we do, and, and this is a, a great example, this particular planet, you can see the, the amount of flux as a function of time is not constant. It's actually changing. If you th this is uh, completely analogous to looking at the phases, uh, looking at the moon as a function of, of day of the, of, the, of, of the month. As the moon moves around the earth, a different amount of the, the, uh, uh, of the surface is illuminated that we can see. And that heats the, the, the moon. The same thing is happening in these planets, and, what, and of course this is happening now on a time scale of 33 hours, but we're actually seeing, and here we're seeing, we're seeing the dark side of, of the planet. Here, we're, at this point, we're seeing the, the fully illuminated planet right just before it goes behind the star. And so from this kind of a curve, you can actually determine the temperature distribution of, of on, that, on that planetary surface. And that, uh, let me skip that, uh, let me skip that. Uh, and that's actually illustrated in, in this slide. This is that same curve for this particular uh, planet. This is the best and the brightest of these uh, planets orbiting other other stars, exoplanets, HD 189733. I should, I should know it, but I don't. I have to read it. But this, this curve tells us what the temperature is on the dark side and on the brightest side. And so, if you will, we've been able to make a, a temperature map of, of this planet. And two interesting things come out of this particular case. The brightest temp, the the brightest portion of the planet corresponds to a temperature of 1,200 degrees. That's pretty hot. This is a, a, a Jupiter-sized planet that has a, an orbital period of about, uh, I guess half, or, half period is, is 33 hours, so it's about a 60-hour period. Much closer to its, its star than Mercury is to the sun. The brightest part of the brightest uh, uh, place on the planet is, uh, the hottest place is 1,200 degrees, the coolest place is 1,000 degrees. That's not a very large temperature uh, drop. And that's telling us that there's a lot of energy from the illuminated side that's being carried over to the dark side. The other interesting thing is that the brightest part is not corresponding to the substellar point, that is to say, noon on that particular planet. In, if, if there were no atmosphere, the brightest, uh, the hottest part would be just where, where, the, uh, uh, just un where the sun looked, was, or the star was right overhead. But it's, it's about 30 degrees away, which tells us that there's an enormous amount of energy that's being carried by, by significant winds in the atmosphere of this planet. So this is a in, very interesting uh, uh, diagnostic that we can use the, the Spitzer data to, to characterize the atmosphere of this planet. Uh, this is using the same technique. You take a, uh, with a spectrograph, you take a spectrum of the star by itself without, uh, when, when, the, when the planet is behind the star. 
You take a spectrum when the planet is right next to the star, so you have the light of the star plus planet, and then uh, the light of the star. You, you take the difference between the two. Now you're taking this at many wavelengths in the spectrum, and you, you, you uh, produce a, a brightness of the planet as a function of wavelength. Um, the, and these are different models of what of the atmosphere of this, this particular uh, planet. It's the, sa the same one that we was talking about before. Um, it's, as it, the quantitatively, what this, this drop in flux from 10 microns down to 5 microns is showing us is that this, this, the atmosphere of this planet is, is dominated by, um, by uh, uh, water vapor, actually steam. At, you describe it as steam it, because it's so hot. But, uh, uh, and it, it, the, it shows the, the, the consistency of our models of what this atmosphere is like with, with the observations. Uh, I would point out that about 40 years ago, we were getting this quality spectrum uh, of, infrared, of, of infrared spectra observing Jupiter. So we've really come a long way. Uh, and certainly would never have guessed that we could do this with, with a, a telescope like Spitzer. Showing the extreme values of the temperature of these, these very hot exoplanets, these hot Jupiters. Uh, this is the hottest one that I'm aware of. This is uh, a planet orbiting uh, some other star called WASP-18, whatever that means. We see the temperature of this planet based on the Spitzer measurements is 3,100 degrees. That's enormous. That's as hot as uh, the atmosphere of a, a star. What it's telling us, at least in this particular case, is that it, we would expect the, uh, uh, the planet to be, uh, the equilibrium temperature would have, should have been about 2,400 degrees. So this is substantially hotter than that. It, it lets us infer two things. Number one, that there's virtually no atmosphere, because so there's no, no energy transport from the front to the back and that the planet's surface is observing, absorbing virtually all of the light from the star. So it's very, very dark, much darker even than the moon. The moon has an albedo, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of light that it reflects of about 10%, maybe 8%. This is infer that the albedo can be no more than, than one, 1 or 2%. So it's a very different kind of material, a like very extreme uh, kind of uh, uh, planet orbiting another star. Uh, at this point, these uh, hot Jupiters are a dime a dozen. And you know, they, five years ago, they were, they were, they were the uh, exciting uh, thing in, in exoplanet research. But now the Holy Grail is finding Earth mass, Earth size, planets orbiting other stars. That's what everybody's aiming for. And one of the ways of doing that is finding planetary systems, uh, transiting planetary systems around very small stars, stars much smaller than, than our sun, where because a star is smaller, the, the effect of uh, finding a small, a small planet like like the Earth, it could be much, much easier to find. And so here's an example where we actually spent a total of 20 days staring at one planet, or one star, excuse me, where we knew that it, it, it had a planetary system. And what you see here is, is the brightness of the star. And then 13 times in this 20 days, uh, you saw the transit of the known planet across uh, uh, as it went across the front, of the face of the star. Uh, that um, one of the goals of this observation was to see was there a planet even the size of the Earth in that in that uh, system. If if there had been a planet the size of the Earth in in this stellar system, it would have caused a drop in in light from from here to here. It would have been easy to see. 
We didn't see it, but this is one of the things that we can do with, this inc with the incredible stability and precision of Spitzer. It's, it's a study, it's a look for these kinds of, of, of small planets. So the forefront now has moved to uh, characterizing the smallest planets that are being detected, what we're now calling super-Earths. And this is an example of one of these. This is actually that same planet, the one where I showed you 13 um, uh, transits. Uh, the planet around this particular star has a, has, a, has a radius of about almost three times the radius of the Earth, six, a mass about six times the uh, mass of the Earth. And by measuring the the depths of the transit, remember where the planet is moving in front of the star, you can, you're measuring the size of the planet at that wavelength. And so here are, we're measuring the, 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 the radius of the planet divided by the radius of the star versus wavelength. Here are the Spitzer measurements. There are measurements at shorter wavelengths from the ground. There's a lot of scatter in these. And one can see that one can start to rule out uh, different kinds of configurations of a rocky planet with different kinds of atmospheres by, by m precisely measuring this, the size of the planet as, as a function of wavelength. So this is what we've done with uh, two, or two, two transits. Uh, I showed you 13. This is the, the precision of of that measurement, and it's, so we have a very precise measurement of the size of the planet at, at this particular wavelength. In fact, the, the uncertainty in our measurement is only uh, 50 kilometers, so the, the real uncertainty is d driven by what is the size of the star. If we could, we can do this easily for these kinds of, of systems. If, if we ever get to the point where one can do the same thing on, on the ground at other wavelengths and really precisely uh, measure the, the size of, of these planets as a function of wavelength, then we'll really be able to, to, to say something really quite meaningful about the, uh, w the atmospheric, uh, uh, the, what, what the atmosphere of this, these kinds of planets really is. So, so the frontier has moved from studying the super, uh, hot Jupiters to really going to super Earth. Uh, and with, with, of course, as I said, the Holy Grail being able to find an Earth-sized planet in, in orbit around another star. And let me go back to uh, sort of trying to, to, to summarize for you what, what, we've, what we've done with Spitzer. We've done uh, an enormous amount. I, I think it's a, an unbiased statement that the combination of Spitzer and Keck data has really led to major advances in, in the most exciting areas of astrophysics. We've, done, we've, we've led the way in, in many of, of these most important uh, uh, studies of, of current astrophysics. And let me just close with telling you where we are, what we're, what we're doing in the future. We're going to operate at least through the end of this calendar year. If the NASA senior review, which is going to occur in about uh, three weeks, is kind to us, we can go for another year or two, uh, and we'll see what, how that works. And I think it is a, a, a fair statement that the, the combination of, of Spitzer and, and Keck really continue to lead the, ast the astronomical world in discovery and understanding. Thank you.